This is a very, very special day for Lexi and her family. Um, this is the day of dedication. And I'm so proud and appreciative of this family. Yes, can you come right up over here? Good to see you. Look at these pretty girls. Oh, wow. How you doing, Saul? Good to see you. Hi, Tuck. Praise God. This is a beautiful family. It's been my joy. Yes. It's been my thrill and my joy to have shared this and wonderful moments in their lives. And I take it, count it as a great, great honor that they would want me to dedicate Lexi to the Lord this morning. And they got three beautiful children. And uh, I can share something kind of funny. Uh, Saul and Meg was gonna get married down in Central Park. And so we all met down there and I'm to do the service. And uh, I tell you, they're brave people. It was uh, that time of the year when there was these blackbirds that came in and they come in in a cloud. They literally swarm the park. And uh, we're about to do the ceremony. <clears throat> and uh, I tell you what, we needed some help because these birds was really messing things up. And I say that figuratively. Uh, they was bombing us all over the place. <clears throat> I felt so sorry for Meg. Uh, she took one bomb and... <clears throat> Uh, but that didn't, bomb, uh, didn't bother her. She just, she's going to get married. And, and then the preacher took a bomb. <laughs> but you know what? We got through it. And I tell you the funny part about it, about the time we getting ready to start, well, Barney Fife pulled up, boom, trying to scare them all off, you know. But, but we made it, and uh, it was a fun time. So let me get serious here, okay? But we're here to dedicate Lexi Kate Melendez. And... Uh, Lexi means stronghold, strong will. Kate means godly example. And so we give you this the, uh, in the book of Psalms 115 and 15. May you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth forever and ever. The Bible says there were little children brought to Jesus and he took them up in his lap. And the Bible said he blessed them there. So from that we learn that our children are to be blessed of God. Throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, parents brought their children to be dedicated to the Lord. We know that in our own earthly selves, we're not really sufficient to fully take care of the child. We'll do our best, but we need divine help, don't we? And so Saul, he recognizes that, and so does Meg. And so that's why they wanted to come to the church and dedicate their beautiful child. I've always called these two girls princesses because they look like little princess to, princesses to me. So I want to bless them this morning. The family is a divine institution that's created and ordained of God from the beginning of time. And our children are a heritage to the Lord. They're going to, these kids are going to bless the Lord and they're going to bless mom and dad. And they have a beautiful future ahead of them. So this morning, would you all stand, and we're going to enjoy this moment of dedicating these wonderful, or this wonderful child to the Lord. Lexi, can you let me put that on your head? Thank you. And before I do that, I want to give this New Testament to Saul. Saul, this is the word of the Lord, and it has Lexi's name on it, inscribed on it, and we want to give that to you. And you can place it in the hands of your daughter. And here's also a certificate of dedication we give to you as well, okay? So let's pray. Could I have your hand, honey? Thank you. What a beautiful girl you are. Look at you. Father, we just thank you for this beautiful family. I love them so very much. And I thank you for this beautiful girl that you've given to this family. And we dedicate her to the Lord Jesus right now for the kingdom of God to always be in her little heart. I pray that her steps will be ordered by the Lord and the angels of heaven will always be around her and guide her. May the Holy Spirit be upon her life and I pray you will use her talents for the glory of God, that she will be a servant of the Lord, a beautiful child, to lift up Jesus' name throughout the world. Bless this home and this family. 
And right now we dedicate Let's the Cake to you. In Jesus' name. Sing it, everybody. Yes, Jesus loves me. I'm with you. The Bible tells me so. How many knows that God loves all of us today? Praise God. Can we make it here? All right. Hallelujah. God is so good to us, and I want to thank um, Saul and Meg for letting me have a part of their family and their lives and I appreciate it. we got another beautiful lady here that has meant a lot to Veronica. Now Linda would you step down here for just a moment. She has meant a lot to us through the years and, and uh, for many years and I call her my sister in the Lord she's a blessing to me and I just want her to stand here with me and I want her to just testify this morning of, her, of God in her life. Bless you. Uh -huh. Y'all have to excuse me. I'm not used to talking in front of a crowd. My name is Linda Gillespie. Some of you know me as Eddie Gillespie's much younger <laughs> sister. Uh, my mother started bringing me to church 25 years ago a here. Long time. Yeah. And at first I thought, eh, I'm not too sure. But my mother kept pushing me and my kids. Then Eddie and I lost the brother that was between us. This was in June of 1997. Broke my heart. Eddie uh, called Pastor and he and him, Veronica had been on vacation, hadn't even been home an hour. And Pastor said, I'll be there. I have to call Rome Ingalls to find out because Robert lived way out in the country. He said, I'll have to find Rome but I'll be there. Pastor came out and he spent time with us. No sleep now. <laughs> and he kept talking to my mother. My mother was the one that really needed it. Mm -hmm. But my brother Robert never drank coffee and he had a can and he probably had a can of coffee for a year or two years. <laughs> but Eddie told me to make a pot of coffee. So I made it. Pastor was standing there and he was talking to me and he looked at me and he said, Linda, I said, yeah, Pastor. He said, one thing, you'll never make me another pot of coffee. <laughs> it, it was horrible. It was the worst coffee I'd ever drank. But it was so old, there's no telling. But I love this man. Praise uh, God. We love you. He did my mother's funeral. My mother had cancer. And he would come out. And he told her, he said, I can't see you every day, but I'll see you when I can. And he would come out and he would pray with her. And then when I had to put her in the hospital for her journey home, he came and he prayed with her. And my mother was at peace. Mm -hmm. I kind of masked my emotions. If any of you have been caretakers, you'll know what I mean. I couldn't cry. I told mm -hmm. everybody, I don't mind if you come see my mama, but you can't cry in front of me because i got to take care of her. Mm -hmm. That day we came down and sat down and pastor talked about my mama like he like he loved my mama so much and it it had always been in my heart that I knew where she was going and I knew she, how much she loved Walt and I cried that was the first day I'd ever cried mm -hmm. and I thought to myself, that man touched me so much. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to tell you, too, I don't know if you both remember, but it was my 40th birthday right after Robert died, mm -hmm. and I got a telephone call. And I heard, happy birthday to you. And I thought, <laughs> who in the world is calling me and singing happy birthday to me? It was Walt, Veronica, and Kim. Mm -hmm. Eddie, had, <laughs> Eddie had asked them to do that, and I thought, wonderful 40th birthday here. 
But I love this man. Well, we love you. And there's nothing anybody's ever going to say about him. Mm -mm, I'm not having it. Uh, and I've been gone from this church for about 18 years. It just, it took a lot to bring me back. My grandbaby is what brought me back. But I just want you to know I love you. We love you, Linda. We love you. Love you so much. Thank you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, the Apostle Paul wrote these words to the church at Corinthians. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. Would you all say, united in mind and thought? And then also in 1 Corinthians 3, 13 and 14, uh, I'm sorry, that's Colossians. It says, bear with me each other, bear with each other, and forgive one another. If any has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these, and over all these virtues, put on love which binds them together in perfect unity. Ephesians 4, 3 says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Romans 12, 16, Live in harmony with one another. Live in harmony with one another. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Psalms 133 and 1. May we remember these verses. May these verses challenge us this morning. The title of my message is Unity. Everybody look at somebody and say Unity. God created his world and the universe to work in harmony. Think of it. The planets the stars of heaven, the galaxies, the heavens above and the earth beneath, the sun, the moon, they have to work in coordination with one another day and night. That is their assignment in the, by the Creator. The planets orbit in their designated space that's given to each of them. The ocean tide rises and falls according to a divine synchronization with planet earth and the heavens above. The line is drawn in the sand. The ocean waves come to that point and no other, the scripture says. In Genesis, when God created the earth and all that's in it, he declared it is good. He could only speak that because he knew it was good. He knew it was worked in unison. He knew that he created it. He knew that it was perfect because he designed it. The whole universe was in harmony and in unity. Then Satan, Lucifer, led a rebellion in heaven against God. And he and a third of the angels that he had convinced to rebel against God were cast out of heaven down to earth where there's been nothing but chaos since that moment. Planet earth is full of destruction. Satan sows discord wherever he's allowed to invade. Disharmony and discord are the weapons he frequently uses among the peoples of the world. He does it in families. He does it in nations. He does it in churches. He does it in organizations. And he does it well. And I'm not bragging on him. I'm just telling you you can see the effects of it. In unity, there is strength and power greatness and protection. In unity there is joy and laughter and fulfillment. In unity there is peace and contentment. In unity there is strength and power. When a family is in harmony, blessings overflow in that family's life. When a church is in unity, the kingdom grows and advances and Christ is exalted always in unity. Do I hear it? Amen. Anything out of harmony is not of God. Anything that opposes unity is not of God. 
You remember when Jesus said, where two of three of you are gathered together, I will appear in the midst of them? Here's what Jesus was saying. Here's what he was actually saying. Where just two or three of you gather together in unity, I will come in and join you. Wow. It takes unity and togetherness to have a happy home and a happy family, a happy church, a wonderful nation. We're called the United States of America, not the divided states of America. We're called the United States of America. What makes this nation great, what its history has done, is because we are a united people. I know we're in trouble right now. (laughs) When the church is in unity, the kingdom grows. When a nation is in unity, it's strong, it's powerful and resilient, a nation of greatness. That's why we are called the United States. That's why we've been the strongest nation in the world for many years. Jesus said a house divided cannot stand, will not last unless there is correction somewhere. America's greatest threat is not from the outside. Our greatest threat is not Russia. Our greatest threat is not Iran. Our greatest threat is not North Korea. The greatest threat America faces today is the division among us. The disunity that is prevalent from the inside of this nation, that's what frightens me. This nation was built upon the foundation, the principles of faith in God and worship and loving God and the principles of the Old Testament and New Testament. Our lack of willingness to agree and live together in harmony is fracturing the very foundation of this nation today. Only God could repair that damage. We need a mighty revival in the land. We need a mighty outpouring, a world-shaking, God-given revival that will bring this nation back to its original place, bring us back to God. We need God now more than we ever needed God. I'm praying that God would send the a mighty outpouring of the Holy Ghost in Washington, D.C., in every state capital, among the leaders of our nation and our world. We need God. He's the only one that can rescue us from what's happening to us. We need to come united again instead of being divided. We need God. We need the consciousness of America to wake up again. I pray that millions of our people will run to the God of mercy and join others to stand against the tyranny and the rebelliousness and the wickedness that we see in Washington, D.C. and many other places of our nation today. It's been reported that some foolish individual in California introduced a bill just the past few days that would ban Christian books and literature from being sold making it illegal to sell them, and the Bible would be included in that in the state of California. Can you imagine how God would feel about that? Let me ask the question, what are you going to do in the day of calamity if that's your feeling? What are you going to do when suddenly there is a tragedy and a disaster? California, you're living right, you're sitting right on the top of the fault line. What are you going to do when the earth opens up and there's devastation everywhere and death everywhere? Who are you going to call on? Who are you going to turn to? Don't forget God who created us, God who loves us, God of mercy and God of grace is also a God of judgment. The United States of America is the greatest nation on planet earth. But we must become again a united people. We're not the divided states of America. We're the United States of America. Together we can do much, but separately we can't do very much. Do I hear it? Amen. Amen. Then let me move to the next subject that I want to talk about this morning, and that is your family. How many loves your family? Praise God. Husband and wife, 
in marriage. Two becoming one. It's a miracle of God how two becomes one. To live together in unity and harmony. One fellow said, two shall become one. Right now we're just trying to decide which one. But I'm glad that God can unite us as husband and wife. Hallelujah. A young man called a radio station that was doing a program teaching on love and marriage. And he said, I need help. And they said, brother, what kind of problem you have? He said, my wife and I were in an argument. And after a long, heated discussion, my wife finally said, okay, you are right. And he said, so what do I do now? (laughs) My advice is shut up. One fellow said, a marriage is a three-ring circus, engagement ring, wedding ring, and suffering. (laughs) What is the difference between love and marriage? Love is blind, and marriage is a real (laughs) eye-opener. One fellow said, if you see a man opening a car door for his wife, you can be sure of one thing. Either the car is brand new or the wife is. Our marriages and our homes are to be heavenly blessed together. A oneness of our lives. If you spend all day long arguing with your spouse, what in the world do you expect to get out of that? A fight. Marriage is to be God's blessing for you. Both man and woman must work together. There must be a joining together, a unity, a harmony, mutual respect and honor for one another. A house divided cannot stand, Jesus said. Your marriage will be what you and your companion makes it to be. You can blame it on her and you can blame it on him. But listen, friend, when you decide that I'm going to make this work and I'm going to love my wife or I'm going to love my husband, I'm going to do the very best I can to have the best family that we can, it's really the choice you make and decision you make. It can be heaven on earth or it can be hell on earth. In unity and harmony, strength and honor, respect, love just grows and you're happy every day of your life and you are contented and you're at peace with yourself and there's joy. Your dream is being realized. Together you can defeat all enemies, but separate you'll suffer. Together you can reach the impossible dream. Together you can build a happy, loving home that can be an inspiration to everybody that knows you and everybody that watches you and sees you. The Bible says, how can two walk together except they be in agreement, in unity? Everybody say unity. That's what marriage is. Two people loving one another, caring about one another, nurturing one another. You say, well, she's got faults. Well, she might have, but you do too. So we've got to help each other. This may come as a surprise to you, ladies, but your husband is not perfect. I'm sure you didn't know that. And it almost so may surprise to you, Gentlemen, that your wife is not perfect. Almost, but not quite. And I can already see it. I I can see prophetically. Some of you are going to go home and say that the preacher up there said my wife is not perfect. Well, let me tell you, this preacher's not perfect either. But with God's help, we can all be better. The Bible said how good and how wonderful it is when God's people live together. That's me and you in unity. That one word, unity, can change your life and bless your life forever if we'll learn to live together in harmony, in togetherness. All 
strong, healthy, blessed marriages have one thing in common. The couple lives together in unity. You just be around them. You can notice how much they adore each other, how much they care about each other, how they treat one another. You can just see that there is love in their words and love in their action. Nothing is allowed to come between them. The Bible says that we prefer one another. In other words, we put each other first. Ruth Graham, Billy Graham's wife, was once interviewed on television. And I remember her saying these words. She was asked by a lady uh, that was interviewing her, Mrs. Graham, have you ever thought about maybe considered divorce? She quickly replied, no, never thought about that, but I sure have thought about murder a time or two. (laughs) Stay in love with one another. Keep one another in your heart close. Always let your wife know, gentlemen, that you care about her, you deeply love her. And ladies, always honor and respect and love him as honorary as he can be is sometimes is i don't know what word i'm searching for but you know what i mean you've called him that many times <laughs> keep your marriage strong keep your romance alive we are to love one another until death do us part write little notes tell your spouse how much you care for her veronica can tell you I, i've I try to practice that. I'm not just preaching that. I try to practice that. I wrote a poem for her yesterday. I'll not read it because some of you just want to throw up. (laughs) Strong marriages develop strong families. Strong families create healthy churches, which leads me to my third and final point. And all of you are saying, thank God he's about ready to quit. Churches that are not unified will have a constant squabble and disagreement of some kind going on all the time. I've told you about the church in in, uh, Florida that they actually split over a supper. One of them wanted to serve chicken and the other group wanted to serve fish. So they absolutely divided the church because they couldn't get along and agree on what to serve at the luncheon. And so they're started another church, and so they call themselves the chicken church and the fish church. How ridiculous. Churches that are not together, churches that are not single-minded, churches that are not together and pray and loving one another will always have a squabble and a disagreement going on. If there is no unity, no spirit of cooperation and agreement, there will always be strife and division. God is not a part of confusion. God does not involve himself into such things in disunity. Again, I repeat, anything that's out of harmony is not of God. Stunted, immature, and unmalnourished church people will cause continually problems. Their thoughts are negative. Their attitude is selfish. Their spirit is mean and uncooperative. Division and strife and suffering will be the result. A person that's not grown up spiritually will find fault with the music, fault with the song, fault with the temperature that's in the room, and you can't believe it, but he'll even find fault with a preacher, the way I'm preaching and what I'm saying. Can you believe that? As good as I'm preaching, they'd find fault with something like that? Everybody laughed. That's supposed to be humorous. It's the devil's business to cause strife and division in the body of Christ. The body body becomes weak and emaciated and crippled when there is division in the body of Christ. The church in the book of Acts was not a perfect church by any means. There was a multitude of things that probably needed to be corrected. They were not perfect. But I want to recite to you in the book of Acts chapter 2, we read, When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one mind. They were all with one accord. There was some unity going on. Hallelujah. There was some unity in the house. I attended a prayer meeting at Crystal Rock Cathedral last night 
where there was a bunch of hungry people that didn't care about a lot of other things. They were just there to love God. There was a hunger that's going on, a thirsting in their spirit. There was a unison that was there. They were all with one mind and one accord, waiting together for the promise of God. And the Bible said, and suddenly, shout it out with me, and suddenly, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and cloven tongue like as a fire set upon each of them. Glory to God. Give him praise this morning. Hallelujah. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. Glory to God. That's what being in one mind and one accord and in unity and togetherness will do. If all you want to do is gossip, my advice to you is go somewhere else. We don't want to hear it. If all you want to do is gripe and complain and whine and cause strife, please go somewhere else. Hit the first door you can. I want to see a church that's on fire for God, that's hungry for God, that loves God, that wants the best that God has for us. I want to see a mighty army of God rising up to do kingdom business, to take back what the devil stole from us and to bring peace in people's hearts and lives. Soul saved and lives healed and blessed. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. If you just want to fault find and backbite, please, when everybody bows their heads, slip on out. This is God's house. This is God's house. I said, This is God's house. We are God's people. This is the place where holiness is. This is the place where the Holy Ghost dwells. This is the place where the Word of God is preached. Dear God, let's come together in unity and and join together in faith. My faith with your faith. This is not a place to play church. This is the real church. Do I hear it? Amen. I want this place to be a healthy body, a mighty church, a unified body. I want our marriages to be strong. I want us to love one another and care about one another. Do I hear it, amen? Amen. Dear God, God's got so much better things for us. We need to just rise up and see in Revelation what the Lord has in store up for you and you and you, every one of us. I want this place to be a place where genuine love is felt, where genuine compassion is felt, a place where the Spirit of Almighty God dwells Every time we walk in this place, we feel a holy presence that can't be described greater than anything we've ever dreamed of. I want it to be a place where the atmosphere is such that miracles happen every service and victories are won and battles are won. I serve notice on the devil. He can sell his ware some other place. This is dedicated to the house of God. This is dedicated to the kingdom of God. We are God's people, and we're in his house. We're destined for heaven. We're commissioned by the Lord to take many souls with us and to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, and we don't have time for anything else. If you want to be that kind of church, I want you to stand to your feet all over this house. If you want your marriages to be strong, please stand together. You say, I'm single. Well, God may be sending you somebody. So let's pray that your marriage will be strong from the very beginning. I just want to tell you, listen to me, please. You can have a blessed home. You can have a blessed marriage. You can have a blessed life. We can have a blessed church. Our nation needs God more than ever. We need to be more united now than we've ever been. God loves us. God cares about us, but it's up to us to stay united. It's up to us to stay together. Hallelujah. God loves you this morning. God cares about you. I want you to join me in prayer, and I want you to help me pray over America this morning. You know, we've we've got such bitterness and hate from one group to another group and from one situation to another situation. 
Last night, I don't know if you saw the news, but this morning, but last night they had a news correspondent dinner in Washington. And the person that had been brought in to be the speaker was a lady, and she berated and used vulgar four-letter four words. Just, it was like the devil spewing out things against people sitting at the desk or sitting at the table. And I thought, where in the world have we, what have we become? And I thought of the book of Jude. The book of Jude said there'd be a generation of people who would speak evil of dignities. In other words, an evil of those that God had put in place. We need to come together as a nation. And I tell you, prayer is going to only be the thing. God is the only one that can bring our nation together. He, he's the only one that can heal your marriage. He's the only one that can save my soul and yours. But please, join me and let's pray for America right now. Father, America was your plan and your idea. You birthed this nation in its infancy, Lord. You spoke to men's hearts. And they used your word as the foundation and the anchor for what this nation would become. God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that our nation has gone astray. I'm sorry that our nation has stooped so low to push you out, to not want to have you in, in our lives and not want to have you in our institution. But God, we are a people who want you here. We want you in our nation. We want you to come back. And we want you to help us as a nation to be united again. You're the only one can bring us together. Nobody else can do it. No human being can do it. So I pray, God, for this blessed nation. In some way, somehow, you would bring us together. And when I pray that prayer, Lord, I'm aware that it may even take some tragedy to bring the nation together. God, be merciful to us. Be forgiving to us. But please unite us as a nation. And then I want to pray over all the families, so would you join me? God, I pray for all the families here that they would be united that they would love one another, overlook one another's mistakes and faults, care for one another, show divine love and acceptance of each other. I pray for homes, I pray for marriages, that husbands and wives will love each other and love their kids, that there would be such love in their home that there would be nothing that could separate them, nothing that would come between them. Bless these people with strong marriages and strong relationships and love and caring for each other. And when the devil comes against them, I pray you'd lift up a standard against the enemy. I pray that you would rebuke that enemy in the name of Jesus and their families would not be hurt. Bless with strong marriages. And then, Lord, I pray over the church body, not just Crystal Rock, but all over the world. I rebuke the devil. I pray, Lord, that the churches will come together and there would be unison once again in the body of Christ and the church would know what it is to be one unified body, strong and healthy and blessed, walking in step with you and in step with the Holy Spirit of God. Bless us, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. I want all of you to lift your hands where you are. Would you do it? Just lift your hands right where you are. And let's welcome the Lord Jesus to come into our lives. Father God, we welcome you this morning to come into each one of us personally. That we would not be out of unity with you. That we would be joined to our Heavenly Father. We would be connected to you, Lord, so there'd be nothing that would separate us from the love of God. Nothing that would separate us from God's love. 
In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much for watching this video, and I want to do this for you today. I want you to join me and just say the, the prayer of the sinner, and I hope that you will let Jesus Christ come into your heart and change your life. God's got a good plan for your life. All you need to do is invite him in, and the Bible said he'll come in and live inside of you. So pray this prayer, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I recognize that I am a sinner that God loves me and that God wants to save me. So I repent of my sins. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and has come to save me. I accept him right now as my Savior and my Lord in Jesus' name. And I thank you, God, for saving my life. Amen. God bless you, my friend, and may the Lord bless you and keep you always in his love.